Yes, you are right. It is yet another episode of the TMC Talk Show, and today we are taking the opportunity to talk with Mike Fernie, the head of social video at Drive Tribe. In this episode, we talk about Scottish accents, Mike's role in the Drive Tribe YouTube channel, and the time Jeremy Clarkson got mad at Mike for driving his Alfa Romeo GTV6. Stick around because you're definitely going to want to hear all of Mike's great stories on this latest episode of your favorite interview series. Welcome to the show, Mike. And to start off, I really just want to talk about how you got into automotive journalism. I know during your college years, you were studying mechanical engineering and ran a blog of your own on the side. So how then did you make that transition to journalism as a full-time profession? So yeah, it's quite an interesting one. Um, I had a, a really bad breakup at uni. And this, this is basically the whole stem of how it all started. Um, I had a really bad breakup and was you know down in the dumps and I was like right what is going to make me happy what what can I do that will just make me the happiest and driving cars was the top of that list so suddenly there was two options it was like okay I could be a racing driver or I can be a motoring journalist and I mean you're 20 21 years old you're not just going to snap into a racing career so I thought no okay you can write a bit I've got my sort of technical background with mechanical engineering and um, I'm just going to give it a go so I started a blog um, called Gasket Case, and uh, I just went round contacts I knew and asked if I could drive their cars. So um, yeah, there was a, one of the first sports cars I ever managed to drive was a friend's a friend's dad's Porsche Boxster, and that was one of the first ones. I somehow got my hands on a Lancia Delta Integrale for the day, which was incredible. Um, and yeah, just alongside my uni work, I would start doing this blogging. Um, and I, I, it, I was really enjoying it. I suddenly had this sort of realization it's exactly what I want to do. Um, so midway through uni, I thought I'm not going to stop my course, but I'm going to look at other avenues to go down. Um, so I looked for work experience at the big publishers down in London. Uh, that's where they all are, Evo, Auto Express, uh, Auto Car, all these places are down there. So I managed to get work experience at Auto Express and Car Throttle. Um, Car throttle being the most interesting one, because that's actually quite close to what I'm doing right now. Um, so they both went really well, but especially car throttle, they actually asked me after I moved back um, to uni, after spending the summer with them, whether, they, whether I'd like to do some freelancing for them. So I actually started writing sort of technical explainer articles for the car throttle audience. Um, and then at the end of uni, I was like, okay, I need a full-time job now, car throttle. Would you, would you like to take me on? Not just as a, as a freelancer, but full-time. And sadly, um, they just didn't have the, the capacity to take me on full-time. So I was like, okay, need to find a, a job elsewhere. So it was actually Auto Express, the other people I did work experience for. Um, I applied for a job, I interviewed, and I actually, I actually got it. It was going to be a sort of Auto Express and Evo combined uh, motoring journalist job but with two weeks to go I then got a Twitter DM from someone at this random company that I had heard a little bit about um, called Drive Tribe and it was the head of content at the time and he said hey liked your stuff on Car Throttle would you like to come write for us and I was like well it sounds better than Auto Express so yeah I'll do it and that was that moved down to London and Started off as a writer at Drive Tribe, and I'm now sort of more concentrating on video. So yeah, that's how the whole sort of journey came to be. Nice. Well, I want for me, Drive Tribe's going to be kind of like a main event. I obviously want to talk about that a lot. And to be quite candid, I have a lot of questions surrounding that. So let's get ready for that. I guess we already talked a little bit about how you did get that job at Drive Tribe, but. When you took the job, were, was the main allure the fact that, you know, James, Richard, and Jeremy were kind of involved in this, or did that, did that not play a role? Um, yes, that was definitely something. I, I was one of those kids that um, was obsessed with Top Gear. I, I could recite a whole load of episodes word by word. Um, I used to watch all the reruns. So the fact that they were involved with it, um, that was definitely something that, twigged with me and I remember chatting to my dad and he was like any sort of access to those guys is only going to help you um, and to be honest that the job um, at Auto Express, Auto Express is one of the 
you know, real cornerstones of the UK car industry. It's one of the main um, publishers. So it would have been a great opportunity to work for them. But there was just something that just seemed more fun and more sort of energetic. And the, I think the opportunity, like Drive Drive being a startup, there is just opportunity for you to, you know, within limits, do your own thing and make it your own and really have influence on what's going on. And that's what's happened. Um, Drive Tribe has just been so moldable. And we've now got to somewhere where we're really happy with what it is. But, you know, right at the start, there was just space to experiment, have a go at this, have a go at that. Um, and that's just been an awesome experience. Um, so, yeah, I'm really happy I, I chose Drive Tribe. And although at the start, uh, the three guys were quite hands off, um, it, we've slowly gotten closer to them. And they've kind of understood what we would like for them as well. And now I'm, it seems crazy to say, but I have got a relationship with James May, uh, Richard Hammond and Clarkson, which, yeah, if you went back to 12-year-old, well, 12-year-old up until 21-year-old Michael and told, told me that, I just think, no, absolutely no way. I'm not going to get close to these guys. So, yeah, it, it, it is amazing to work for them. And to be honest, that helps. The second you can drop those names in, not that we overuse it, but the second you can tell someone that they're involved with the company, it just opens doors like nowhere else I think can. So, yeah, it's it's been awesome. So after they, uh, James, Jeremy and Richard, after they decided to maybe take a step back from the Grand Tour, I mean, they still do some stuff, but it's obviously not as intensive, right? So once they did that, is that when they started to get more hands on with Drive Tribe and you started to develop some relationships with them? Um, yeah, I think, so Drive Tribe launched in 2016 and that was, you know, uh, not, not too far away from when the Grand Tour was pretty much at its peak. So they, they did a hell of a job to launch it at, at kind of the same time as them having to go away and film. So yeah, for the first couple of years at Drive Tribe, um, there wasn't too much interaction with them. They'd pop in, see how things were doing. But in terms of content, we had the odd little live stream or video here and there. But um, as I said, we're, at that point, we kind of didn't know where we wanted to go. Did we want to link it to just Clark's Hamden and May, or did, did we need to make it more than that? Um, so I think we erred towards almost staying away from them, so we weren't too dependent. But I think we quickly realized that and the whole brand was launched by them, it was built by them, and we needed to just involve them more. So about two, two and a bit years ago, we had our first first video with James May and it just exploded. And we were like, right, okay, we've we've been sitting on this audience and not really giving them what they wanted. And it's been amazing ever since. Um, we've had all three guys on, um, obviously some more than others, but that's purely dependent on how busy each guy is. Um, and yeah, I think especially the Drive Tribe YouTube channel has gone, I mean, when I sort of took it over and had influence on it, um, it was on 200 like 240,000 subscribers and now we're looking we're probably in the near future going to hit 1.5 million so just and I, I'll be honest most of that is down to us getting interaction from those guys our first Clarkson video was just insane people I think we had 120,000 subscribers in a couple of weeks or something it was absolutely crazy the uptake on that video so yeah, it's it's amazing that we have those three guys for not too much time during a month, but when we can, we get the most out of them. And yeah, the audience just absolutely love it. We've inherited the top year audience. Um, and yeah, it's, it's definitely paying dividends. What are some of your activities and responsibilities as the head of social video at Drive Tribe? Is it, you know, just hosting those videos or are you also behind the scenes writing scripts and doing that sort of thing? Yeah, I'm. I I basically do most most things. Um, I come up with the ideas for videos. I will script them, um, and then you know come up with call sheets and kind of stage directions for those videos. And then either they're a video that I'm presenting or it's it's for someone else. And it's not just Clark Sam and May. We've also had um, Ed China from Wheeler Dealers. Um, we've had a couple of uh, influences on recently, TJ Hunt and um, uh, Doug DeMuro we had just a few weeks ago. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of own it, it, most video, 
I'd say 90% of the video you see anywhere on Drive Tribe, I've kind of had something to do with it. Um, and you split those into two things. So we do organic video, which is most of the stuff you see, but also one of Drive Tribe's main um, sources of revenue is commercial video. So they are much more intense experiences. You script those, but they have to go to the client and the client looks over them, they need to make sure they're happy with it. And also they're just much more difficult videos to get right because these days sponsored videos can go one way or the other. An audience can be a bit iffy about a thing being sponsored. So you have to be really careful with, with how you go about it. But I think I think we, we've done okay with it. But um, yeah, I'm, I, I basically own the whole video process on Drive Tribe and there's other people um, like I'm, I'm managed by Lucy Brown. I don't know whether you've you've seen her on the channels and stuff. Um, she she's my manager, so she's kind of looks over everything I'm doing. But I've got quite a sort of free reign in terms of um, in terms of coming up with the video ideas. Because I think I, if I wasn't at Drive Tribe, I would be a big fan. I'd be a subscriber watching it all. So I I do feel that I've got that kind of link to the audience so I, I i would like to think i know what they want and i can see a, a banger of a video coming a mile off um so yeah i there's sometimes we stray from the path but m most of the time i think we've kind of nailed our formula and yeah it's, it's going well so I, I know you're talking about how drive tribe was kind of this startup sort of environment when you first started and you know, like I said, writing ninety percent of the video. Is it still relatively a small team or a small group of workers? Yeah, I think we we peaked as a company at I want to say fifty people. Um, now we're at a nice tight team of around about thirty odd, um, and a nice little office in Chiswick in London. Um, yeah, it's 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 a nice little. Is there's still a, a startup vibe, um, but I think the dust has settled a bit. Uh, what I've been saying to people recently, whenever they ask about how how the company is doing, is I think we are now settled with what Drive Tribe is and what we want it to be in future. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, one of the main things is um, commercial video. That's now become this big uh, revenue intake for us. So we're now, we're now just knuckling down on those things, especially in this current financial climate. You just have to go in with what you do well and what you can make money with. Um, so I think Drive Tribe, there, there are still startup aspects. There is still things that you can mold. Um, like if we wanted to change our video strategy tomorrow, it would just take a quick meeting and we'd, we'd go for it and see how it does. There's still that flexibility. There's no real big corporate um, strangleholds on anything. Um, so, I mean, how old are we now? We're about four, coming up to four years old. Um, so we're, we are definitely emerging from being called a startup, but there are those nice aspects where if you want to mold something to the way you think it should be, there is still the availability to do that. Nice. Well, I've gone through some of your blog posts from your university days, and in one article in particular, you pointed out how if you ever got in front of a camera, you would turn it into a mumbling, sweaty mess. So then how the hell did you end up making videos for this huge automotive YouTube channel? I was, I was slightly scared when you said you'd discovered my blog. I was like, which one is he going to read? Um, can I ask which one that was in? Do you know which um, article that was? I think, well, I'm going to bring this up at, at a later point in the interview as well. But I think this was the article in which you were talking about how YouTube was becoming a big thing and how that was going to like supersede traditional automotive reporting. Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, I sucked at drama at school. I was awful at any sort of performing, especially just myself. I'd just get sweaty and I couldn't really get my words out. And, um, you know, my mum and dad, you asked my mum and dad when it came to like school performances, school plays or anything like that, or choirs or all that rubbish. Um, I, I just kind of froze up. I wasn't that confident. So they find it really weird that I've now fallen into this this um, presenting role. But I think that the real inspiration for me when I was growing up with cars was very specifically the Evil Magazine YouTube channel. Um, 
they just made the most amazing videos. They were very indulgent, but I kind of liked that. You know, 20 minute long, almost like poems about cars they were driving. Specifically, Henry Catchpole, who's at um, the Car Fiction YouTube channel these days, and actually used to work at Drive Drive. Um, he just made the most amazing videos. After this, if you haven't seen it, type in Evo Magazine, Aston Martin Vantage, Scotland, and then watch that video. He's in an Aston Martin Vantage, um, I think the Nürburgring edition, or the N430, and he's going through the highlands of Scotland, which, of course, you know, really grabs me by the heartstrings. And it's just the most amazing video. So watching that, I was thinking, I was, you know, I was doing my blogging and I was loving it. Um, and th that was the aim. That's the, that was the peak for me. Like being, being given a car like that and just being able to just pour your heart out about what's going on. Um, so, yeah, it's really weird that now I'm, like, I, I'm now in, in that space. Like, I, I'm, you know, embargoes are a thing. Um when it comes to automotive video, you know, if you've, if you've filmed a car on a launch, you'll see that the embargo lifts and suddenly all, all the videos from everyone all come out. So I've had many situations where my embargoed video is coming out right below Henry Catchpole's or right above Henry Catchpole's. And it's like, what? You know, you th think back to being at uni, just staring at these videos and suddenly, I mean, I'm, I'm still nowhere near as talented as him, but I'm, there's no two ways about it. We are competitors with Carfection. Um, and that, that blows my mind. I, I, if I meet him at an event or see him, I'm still this sort of crumbling mess and completely fanboy towards him. Um, but you kind of also have to just push past that and be like, wait a minute, I'm here to do a job. He's here to do a job. And we're both kind of in the same space. Um, so yeah, it's very, very weird to me that the whole YouTube thing has happened. But an opportunity came up at Drive Tribe. We kept using freelance presenters, but I think the one thing with YouTube audiences is you can't keep dotting around. You need to like commit to a face. Um, obviously, the trio would be the perfect way around that, but it's just not feasible. So I kind of decided, right, I am going to try and be that face. And I don't know how my first drive tribe video was a, a group c 1980s jaguar xgr9 and watching that back i'm like how the hell did i get another shot at this how the hell did my bosses say mm, pack that in you're boring you're waffling on just stop um but no the opportunity was there i took it and two years later um it's all going really well so it, yeah it is really odd but i'm really glad it's it's happened the way it's happened you do a segment for the Drive Tribe YouTube channel called Mike's Mechanics. Since you have a mechanical engineering degree, you might be a bit more qualified than most to do this. So in your opinion, how much engineering and technical knowledge does an automotive journalist need to possess in order to do their job well? Um, the answer to that is either a really solid amount or nothing because um, I think for, when it comes to standing out as a, a journalist, like loads of people want to do motoring journalism. And I think you, instead of trying to be like anyone else or trying to appeal to a broad audience, I think it is worth just finding your niche. And my specific niche was technical explainer articles that were sort of easily digestible. And I actually think because, I mean, I'm not some engineering whiz kid. I mean, um, engineering explained jason he's unbelievable um, i have a base level knowledge that allows me to understand most things happening in a car and i think that actually then helps make explain things easier i almost think if you know too much that can kind of hinder things and um, that's maybe just an excuse for me making mistakes sometimes but um no i think um if you're if you're joining automotive journalism, your niche does not need to be a technical one. It could be that you are a absolute wordsmith and just your writing can get people reading, or it could be you've just had experiences that other people haven't had uh, haven't had. So you just have things to 
pick up on and things to hack into with your writing that other people just just don't have um so no i don't i don't think you need a sort of mechanical know-how unless you want that to be your little niche but once you're in motoring journalism and you're going to press launches and you're reading press releases and rewriting them you definitely absorb uh technical things because every single car launch you know there will be an engineer there trying to explain something new on the car so there are journalists who aren't engineers or haven't got degrees in anything but they have just absorbed all this car tech knowledge so that they almost become sort of mini engineers in, in, in terms of what, what what they can sort of tap into when they're writing an article so no there's no pressure i think the main thing in journalism is being able to write i think that's the first thing and then knowledge can be sort of learned if, if you can just if you have a natural knack for writing that is a huge leap forward instead of being this whiz kid in terms of car knowledge and then sort of not great with your words um so yeah i think anyone aspiring to be a journalist get your words spot on and then you can build on top of that okay well that is the end of my questions about drive tribe for the time being as we are now transitioning to my favorite segment sid asks stupid questions to respected members of the automotive community and you see mike i actually lied because my first question of the segment is yet again about drive tribe um <laughs> This is slightly embarrassing, but I don't really get the point of Drive Tribe. I know that many of your YouTube videos are done by James, Richard, and Jeremy, and then we've obviously talked about everything that you do. But then we also have these other branches like Food Tribe, and then there's a page about smart homes. So help me understand a little bit how this whole ecosystem of media is supposed to work. Very good question. Um, so Drive Tribe initially was supposed to be a straight up social media platform for cars um, and i think very quickly you find out that the facebook for cars is facebook and the instagram for cars is instagram and the youtube for cars is youtube you you have to just you have to bow down to these leviathan platforms and adapt to them some people manage to nail it and do create their own social media properly big social media platforms but it's very very rare actually car throttle decided to do our initial sort of copy of that back in the day and um, it didn't quite work out for them but saying that drive tribe is a proper community it has really developed i think there were some issues when it first launched um, i think one of the main things was allowing basically too many people to have everything it was very um you know, open. Everyone could have a tribe. Everyone could write articles. Everyone could do everything, and that makes it non-exclusive, and therefore it's not really much in demand. Um, so I actually think by restricting Drive Tribe at the start, it could have been more successful than it is now. But saying that, we've got this platform now with hundreds of thousands of people that use it every single month. Um, if not billions, I need to check with Lucy about the, the numbers on that one. Um, and it's still what it's set out to be. It is, you, you can write articles, you can upload videos, you can upload any car con content you want, and it will get shown to the masses. So you can write articles, you can write a car review, and suddenly that the internet can see it. It's got the potential for us to post it on our other social media channels and show it to the world. There's no other um, competitor to that, really. Um, you can't write something on Evo magazine and get them to, you know, po post it anywhere. You know, it's, the, it's just not the done thing. But we have a creators program on Drive Tribe where you can write an article about you driving your mum's car to school the other day and what happened on it. And if it is good enough, it floats to the top and it can be seen by tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people so that's still this really unique thing that drive tribe has and that the community is just growing and growing every single day food tribe is basically started off as the same thing but it's in a ecosystem that's just so much bigger i mean everyone eats so and everyone is consuming more and more food content instagram is inundated with pictures of people's food so there's this huge market there 
and it's actually turning out to be more successful than Drive Tribe. Drive Tribe is this massive thing that we've built over four years, but actually the rate of change from Food Tribe and the rate of change of sales that we're having, you know, c- commercial deals with Food Tribe is going to overtake Drive Tribe at some point. And I think that's natural because cars are quite a specific niche. They're quite a nerdy thing if you're into cars, but food is food. You know, everyone can, um, you know, t- tap into whatever food they love and all that sort of thing. Um, and that may not be the last thing. Like we're, the Drive Tribe was almost the starting concept and Food Tribe has been the sort of first copy and paste of that same formula and who knows i'm not allowed to say there could be other verticals that we go into um just off the top of my head and absolutely linked to nothing there's you know sport music pets you know it's other huge areas that we've got the tech we've got a social media platform that we have constructed ourselves doesn't belong to anyone else it's our ip and we can take any vertical take any subject and insert it in there so it's an incredible tool and we have plenty of people knocking on the door asking how it works and whether they can be involved so um that's where we are it's currently drive drive and food tribe but who knows in future well maybe it's time for me to put some of my own articles on drive drive (laughs) yeah but nice question on instagram you are followed by richard hammond but not james may or jeremy clarkson (laughs) is this because richard really likes you and you guys share a good relationship or is it more due to the fact that jeremy james don't interact with you all that much um well i actually think in terms of our relationships i would expect james may to be the one that follows me but um i think hammond Hammond can be like very intense in a short sort of short bursts. So he he's um, very very friendly for the, the small time that we have with him. Um, Paul James May we have more time with him, so it's like more chill and we're more just like general pals compared to the others. Um, so yeah, I think Hammond must have just liked something that I'd done, or I might have tagged him in something, and he thought, oh, that that's Mike from filming the other day i'll give him a follow but i think james may he likes instagram twitter is his favorite so i think he kind of doesn't really care about instagram um so yeah i'm I'm not too bitter about that clarkson (laughs) i've uh i mean i've only i've only met the guy two or three times really um one of those being the uh, Alfa Romeo debacle. So he's not going to follow me on We're Instagram after that. that. A bit. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure we are. I've been inundated with both love and hate with regards to that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can't see him following me on Instagram ever, but you never know. Interesting. Well, to be blunt, I felt like I had to bring this up at some point, the Scottish accent. It probably has to be one of the coolest and most unique accents out there. When you started presenting videos, was there ever a part of you that was afraid no one would understand or pay attention to what you were saying because they were distracted by your Scottish accent? Um, it's thought that I feared people would. They, they don't understand what I'm saying half the time. <laughs> at the start, people were, genuinely, there was comments saying, is this guy speaking English? And I, 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 some, something I've picked up on is that when I do get nervous and when sometimes when I'm chatting to one of the three guys I do I struggle to get my words out I slur a bit but I've got much better at it and I did take those comments to heart which is what you do when you first start on YouTube you you do read all the comments and people are very nasty and you suddenly think well that's my voice so I don't really know what to do about that um but you just you just get stuck in it becomes your thing um it's you hear from the people that hate your accent and you don't hear from the people that love your accent that's just the way it works um so no i it's it's my heritage i'm very very proud of it uh i am surrounded by people with english accents and i think they sound really boring and unimaginative so yeah I, I'm, I'm very happy that i've got my accent and i'm going to continue with it yeah for me scottish accent it's got to be up there one of the best <laughs> Well, now we're going to talk about Clarkson in the GTV6. 
So you drove the GTB6, his favorite car, without his permission. Now, Jeremy Clarkson has punched a man for an offense much more <laughs> minor than driving his car without his permission. What were you thinking, and off camera, how mad did he get? So I've had loads of people ask me about this, and like, pe people think I'm like lying, and that it, it became like something massive. But no, I'll tell you exactly what happened, which isn't too far away from what the video said. I was very honest in that video. Um, we had a phone call about what we were going to do on that day with um, Jeremy's girlfriend, who helped run the farm. Um, and she said, just off the cuff, oh, and by the way, we use the Alfa Romeo and the excellent, the lifted Mercedes, as um, sort of advertisements outside the farm shop. So um, come meet us in the morning, have a meeting, and we'll just quickly drive down in those cars and put them in place. I was like, oh, Lucy, this is fantastic. We'll only be driving it 200 yards, but we need to do so. I'm driving Jeremy Clarkson's either the Alpha or the Excellent, like GoPro it up and we'll just film, we'll just record and see what happens. Um, and so that's what we did. We turned up, Clarkson was away filming um, for his Amazon farm show. Um, and Lisa popped in the Excellent. So I was like, okay, the Alphas, I'm going in Alpha. Start up the Alpha, drive it, the 200 yards from Jeremy's house down to the down to the farm shop, park it up, and then we started filming at the farm shop for a food tribe. So we were going to film with the cars later on. And now that I mean, I had the keys, we were in control. But then we finish filming at the farm shop for food tribe and start heading back up to Jeremy's place to have lunch. And there's a big Range Rover Vogue coming the other way. And I'm like, that's JC himself. And he starts to slow down and rolls down his window. And I'm like, mm, what is this all about? Um, so he asks, where, where is my alpha? And it's, you know, we say, oh, it's, it's down at the farm shop. And he asks, okay, who, who drove it there? And Lisa was like, oh, it's Mike from Drive Drive. Um, so, yeah, Jer Jeremy didn't. Well, wasn't a fan of that. <laughs> um, he he is the one and only person that drives that car. Although actually, if you follow Harry's garage, um, Harry drove it. He's just a little video of a proper drive in it. So, jammy bastard. Um, but yeah, I I didn't have permission. Um, I, from my perspective, Lisa's permission was Jeremy's permission because I thought, well, surely Lisa knows whether the car is allowed to be driven or not. Um, but no, it wasn't the case, and very quickly, Jeremy went down to the shop and drove the Alpha back to his house. But then I was, I was up front. I went up to him during lunch and was like, hey, Jeremy, we would like to film a video with your Alpha. Um, it, it's fine. If it's static, we'll, we'll make do. Is that okay? And he, he was totally fine. Um, he wasn't angry. He wasn't, you know, furious, really, at, at all. He, he just genuinely didn't want someone driving his car and genuinely wanted to know where it was and where he could bring it back. So, yeah, everyone thinks there's going to be this massive tirade and where is my car and all that kind of stuff. But no, it, it just wasn't like that. And we did. We filmed with it static. There's about three seconds of footage that thankfully Lucy got on her phone of me pulling into the farm shop. So there's at least some evidence that I was behind the wheel at some point. But, um, I mean, that video is nearly on half a million views now, so it was definitely worth doing, despite everyone being like, well, you didn't bloody drive it, did you? And I'm like, well, I did, but we just didn't film too much of it. Um, so, yeah, it, it was totally fine in the end. And actually, the way I look at it is that if we'd gone there, we'd filmed with the Alpha and come away again, I would have had very little interaction with Jeremy himself. But the fact that but it wasn't, I wasn't allowed to drive it and this sort of debacle happened, I hopefully like, will have made a, a bit more of an impression on him. Next time he sees me, he'll be like, that's that kid from Drive Tribe that drove my Alpha. Um, so although it's initially like a negative thing to happen, I think it will help in the long run and it hopefully will be a sort of joke that we can you know, have a laugh at down the line, but we'll see. Well, that's my last stupid question for the time being. So we'll get back into the thick of it. And this next question is one that I'm particularly interested to hear your response. So I want to go back to talking about one of your blog posts in which you wrote about how traditional automotive reporting was disappearing. And this whole crew of automotive YouTubers was taking its place. 
Obviously, there is a fair amount of crappy content out there on YouTube. Some might even consider my channel to be part of that crap. But as a generality, what is your opinion towards the so-called automotive influencers? Good question. Um, I think there are some that have kept up with the times and are real beacons of what people should look at in terms of if, if they want to be automotive YouTubers themselves. YouTube is a constantly changing game and you have to keep up with what the algorithm is doing if you want to stay on top of it. And some people have the sort of work ethic and the nous to read into what's going on, look at their audience stats and adapt to what's going on. Unfortunately, there are some who, when the whole sort of auto, uh, car YouTuber thing kicked off, they were massive. They had very quick growth, but are have have never adapted. They've just they've got templates for videos that they do, and it's just copy and paste every few months, and it's just a churn. And their audience has got bored. Um, their subscribers, you know, they've got this huge subscriber count because they've been around since the start. But you then look at how many people of those are actually watching the videos and you're like, whoa, their audience has disappeared. So there's definitely people that were at the top of the game and are just kind of hanging on now. And it is it's a shame to see. It's not like I'm like, oh, yes, we've overtaken them. It's like, oh, no, it's genuinely a shame that they've not sort of kept up with the times. Uh, and it's a stress for me. I'm, con I, You know, if a, video, if a video doesn't quite do well enough, on the Drive Tribe channel to our expectations, suddenly I'm like, oh God, here we go. We're gonna be like so-and-so, you know, it's, it is a stress on my mind. Um, in, ter in terms of influencers versus journalists, which is actually, I've grown up in, in motoring journalism right at that time. I actually wrote an article on Drive Tribe about a fight on Twitter between a, um, a, a YouTuber and a journalist at the time fighting over who got more views. It was very petty, but, I think I don't. I can't remember what I said in that article. I was probably ripping into them. Wait, wait. What was I doing? Was I slagging off influencers, or was I saying journalists are old school? Oh uh, well, yeah. You're kind of like ripping into Shmi and uh, like saying like it says yeah. old was annoying, okay. that sort of thing. <laughs> but sorry, I think uh, <laughs> yeah. You're just talking about how traditional automotive, you know, journalism reporting was kind of going away. And instead, it was more of these influencers that were taking their taking their spot. Yeah, and I think that has that has developed into um, automotive brands now. I would say almost prioritizing the influencers above the journalists. Uh, you know, back in like twenty twelve till about twenty fifteen, the influencers were seen as this kind of unknown fad, and would they just go away and? brands didn't really want to be involved with them because some of the videos were a bit silly. But now, if a brand comes out with a car and they want it to be seen as by as many people as possible, you can't feasibly get all the magazines in because they're just magazines. Like that, that world is just getting smaller and smaller by the day. Bring Tim Schmee 150, bring JWW, bring you know some of your American guys, Doug, uh, Stradman, all those guys, and the eyes that you're getting on your content just explodes. The return on investment for bringing them on a launch versus a journalist for a magazine that's been around for a hundred years, it, it, it isn't even comparable. There's now on car launches, there's now two launches sometimes that they do mesh together most of the time, but there can be an influencer launch and a journalist launch. And sometimes, because the influencers are going there to make videos and not, I don't want to disrespect writing articles, but it obviously takes less time than editing a full video together. The first batch of people on the launch are the influencers. They get prioritized, and then the traditional car journalists come along. And that doesn't go down well, because the journalists are like, you know, they still see these sort of youngsters as being just, you know, a waste of space, basically. But uh, there will be a time where um, it it just goes completely the other way, and it's it's mostly guys with cameras and very few people with notepads and their laptops going. Um, and I've kind of surfed between the two 
I started off as that little kid sitting on the seat, um, and, you know, after driving a car with my laptop, looking over it, seen through glass and uh, supercars of London and all these guys filming, thinking, oh, my God, I'd love to do what they do. And now it's, it's the other way around. I, I very rarely just write an article. It's almost certainly going to be a video. Um, so I, actually, after this, I'm going to go back and read what I, I said in that article. It's going to be quite interesting to see what I say. But um, if influencers have been the way forward since then, and they are the way forward now. And I think any brand, watching journalism still definitely has a place because they have a very engaged audience who are probably older and can actually buy the cars. Um, but in terms of eyes and brand awareness for youngsters to then grow up and want those cars that they've seen said YouTuber in, um, there, there really is no replacement. When I read your articles or watch your videos, there is a fair amount of comedic relief mixed with strong opinions. Obviously, in the world of media, engagement is a must. But how exactly do you go about making something interesting? Take something like Mice Mechanics, for example. You could be talking about superchargers, something pretty technical. And while you'd want to divulge the right information to the viewer, you also, at the same time, don't want to bore them. So how exactly do you accomplish that? So I have this kind of mantra when it comes to coming up with video ideas, and it's, making your stuff niche but mainstream. So finding niche areas that people haven't tapped into yet, but they are very well known. And all it is is someone hasn't decided to go mining in that area yet. Um, for example, I'd say my first sort of hit in terms of on YouTube for Mike's Mechanics was um, a racing car that flipped in the air at Le Mans. It did a full, like, cup the two and a half flips I think in the air and it was just the most amazing thing and everyone has seen that video that bit of footage of the Mercedes doing that but I had a look and no one are creating content as to why that happened so immediately I was like okay if we've got a thumbnail of that car flipping and how the hell did this happen pe people are going to click on that so it's a it's a niche Le Mans is a, is a niche little area and aerodynamics is even more niche but um, that everyone's seen that crash. So it's a niche area, but it's a very mainstream subject. So if you can combine those two things, you're getting clicks and it's stuff that people have never seen before, but it's stuff that they're kind of attached to just by being a car fan. Um, so another video was a V4 engine. How does a V4 engine work? Um, I think that was my first million view video. And again, V4s are such rare engines that you, barely any cars have ever had a V4, but you suddenly have a picture of it and you have V4 in the title and people know V engines, they know a V6, a V8 or even a, a V twin, but they don't know a V4. So they're like, oh, I'd really like to know about that. So they click on it. So that's always the aim, not to be too obvious, but as you say, not to be too sort of boring and niche. You need to, if you can get it right in the middle, you then have this perfect storm. And Engineering, engineering Explained um, does very similar things. He, he will look at a press release of a new car, say the Koenigsegg Gemera or something like that, and he will almost surpass the big headline stuff and focus in on one bit of tech that is actually really interesting. And if, and if you get the thumbnail right and you get the title right, that video can outperform anyone that's just saying, oh, look at this new Koenigsegg. If you really pinpoint it, um, you can just get a way more engaged audience. And yeah, that, that's, that's what I strive to do. There's two videos at Drive Tribe. There's Niche But Mainstream or Clarkson Hammond and May. Those, those are the two things that will get people clicking. Um, and yeah, I, th I think we've done okay. There's a few things that, I mean, you, you don't have a hit every single time. So there's some times where we do is, is just too niche. We've just gone slightly too far the other way and not many people click. Um, and it can work the other way as well. You've just, your, your title's been a bit too simple. The video is a bit too, you know, people have been there and done it, so they won't click on that. So it's about finding that real middle point. Well, my last question, what is your favorite part about your job? 
Is it driving cars, presenting, meeting new people, traveling? What has been that best part for you? Um, I think, oh, let me have a think about this one. What's the best part? The, on, on a video shoot, um, there is a moment where I've had to source the car, I've, I've scripted the video, I've sourced the location that we're going to film at, and then suddenly, it happened just the other week. Um, I was in, do you know what an MGSV is? It's quite a niche British car, but it was I like MG Supercar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like MG Supercar from like 2004. They made like only a few with like basically Mustang bits in it. Um, so just last week, I was sat in an MGSV at this sick location and had the script that I'd written in my head ready to go. And you just have 10 minutes of just driving the car and not bothering about recording a video, just experiencing the car so that you, you have that time to yourself before you essentially start working. Um, and that just says to me that, like, my God, how the hell does this work? You know, some of the stuff, I, I was going around Silverstone in a GT4 car just last week, and it's like, how, how am I getting paid for this? I'm like, what is this? How, how is this a thing? Um, but then I think, well, someone's got to do it. Same with Clark's Hamden and May. They'll be doing stuff on the Grand Tour or back in the day on Top Gear, thinking, how am I getting paid for this? But it, it is a job, and someone has to fill those shoes, so why not make it you? Um, so I would say, yeah, that, that, those 10 minutes before the cameras roll and you just have the car to yourself is awesome. But then on the other side, you've made the video, it's done, it's been edited, and it goes out. And it is a nerve-wracking thing. I, I don't know whether you use the YouTube Studio app, but once a video goes live, you then have that half hour wait to see the stats go. And after that half hour, basically YouTube gives you a very brutal output as to how your video is doing. It ranks it versus your others. It gives you the view count, the watch time, the whole body lot, the likes, dislikes. And that can go either way. But see, when you open that YouTube app on a video you're really proud of, and it says one out of 10, and it's really, it's going really well. And you're more than happy to look into the comments because you already know that, you know, people must be loving this and you, you see that in the comments. That's probably one of the most, um, uh, what do I want to say? Um, one of the most rewarding things. Nice. Well, Thanks for coming on to the show, Mike. It's been really great talking to you, uh, learning a little bit about what drive, what the point is of drive drive, and then obviously what you do in relation to drive drive. So thank you. I oh, said so they've been fantastic questions, and the amount of research you've done and the graft you've gone into to make this happen and make other interviews happen that I've looked at you've done. That is exactly what you need to do to stand out from others and climb up that ladder and if you just keep doing exactly what you're doing something will happen a bit of luck will come your way and things will really take off so i'm really gonna keep track of what, what you've been doing and you're so young as well people say i'm young in the industry all everyone in their 30s i'm i'm turning 27 um soon and everyone thinks i'm young so you are mega young so the fact that you're doing this and you've been chatting to much more important people than me in these interviews, um, that is the level of graft that doesn't normally exist in someone your age. So good luck. And I can almost guarantee that you're going to go places. So yeah, well done. Thank you.